standing in the Critter House at the Leslie Science and Nature Center. Um, I work for the Leslie Science and Nature Center and the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, and we typically try to offer a variety of STEM-related programs for folks of all ages. And while most of my job actually revolves around the animal care or taking care of the needs of the wildlife that are housed here at the Leslie Science and Nature Center, the really cool thing is that when I have the opportunity, I can then talk to folks and show some of those really cool wildlife or those wildlife teachers, as we like to call them, that we have here to help promote really great concepts around the natural sciences. And so today's presentation goes about 1030. As Galen mentioned, we're talking about these things we call nature's recyclers. We'll also have a presentation by um, someone from the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum at one o'clock about wind energy today. So I encourage folks that are attending this presentation to stick on for the rest of today's events. Now, when we talk about nature's recyclers though, there's a couple key things to think about. We know, we humans, we can go through our recycling program, being able to take different materials, some that might be man-made or some that are made from natural materials, and either have them be biodegradable or be able to transform and reuse components of those objects to basically make other things, other tools that we need. Well, recycling has actually been happening for millions of years just out in nature, out in the wild. And it's really all because of how matter works. See, matter can't really just be created out of thin air and it can't just be destroyed and no longer exist. So a lot of the things that we see, whether we go out in the woods, materials we use in our house, are actually just made from other components, other materials. And the really cool thing is today, we're gonna to try to give you guys a chance to meet some of these live animals, some of these nature's recyclers that you can actually find right outside your window or right at home, especially if you have an amazing natural space. Now, the other component about recycling or about this matter is that different objects or different living things do this thing we call decomposing which is just the, the breaking down of this organic material. And the weird thing though, is that when we use the word decomposer, usually what we do is we use that term to talk about all things that break down dead organic material. When in fact, there's really only two true decomposers out there. And the reason is it all depends when we talk about what it means when you break down the matter. Now, I'm not the best artist in the world, but I drew what the two true decomposers would be, if you will. Now, if I had to pick them, we usually classify them as this. You can probably see it on my screen. I have bacteria, as a, as a nice round protozoa over there with a little bit of flagella, or fungi. Mushrooms are usually the biggest type of fungi we know about. That's it. These are the true decomposers. Why? Well, it's because when we talk about the word decomposer, we're not just talking about things eating dead stuff. We're talking about taking enzymes and juices and absorbing this dead organic material externally. These things, they don't have a digestive system like you and I, so they actually have to eat or break down this material, if you will, externally, outside, using different fibers and more. They are also usually there at both the early and the last stage of decomposition when it comes to breaking down this organic material. So you will always find bacteria, and most often, especially out in wooded spaces, you'll almost always find fungi being a part of this kind of nature's cleanup crew, if you will. The great thing is, is that beyond just talking about these true decomposers, now you have to categorize everything else. Um, a lot of times we talk about earthworms or things that we find under a log as being decomposers too. But the term you're gonna hear me use a lot today is actually something that we call this. Uh, detritivore. Uh, some folks may have heard of this word before, or better yet, you might have heard of a word like it, like carnivore, or herbivore, or omnivore, which is really what this means is the things that we talk about or classify as detritivores are just eaters of dead stuff. Um, detritus is the material. And so everything you meet today is basically a kind of detritivore, being able to break down, eat, this dead organic material, and that they have different kinds of digestive systems that may or may not be similar to ours. 
The great thing though, is that there's thousands and thousands of species of detritivores out there. And while we only have half an hour, we're gonna try to look at a few that we find locally or a couple that we find around the world. Now, most often when we are looking at the detritivores, they're relatively small, but most often where you're gonna find them is where you're gonna find their food source. So if you're walking through the woods, if you look out your backyard, you may notice there's a log or fallen leaves on the ground. All of this dead organic material is really just things that were once alive, like say plant and animal material. And then, excuse me, from there, what happens is these things will break it down and basically get rid of the physical material, but leave the nutrients. That's the other big key thing about our natural recycling program. These things aren't just eating dead stuff and being nature's cleanup crew. They're also leaving behind essential nutrients for other things to use to grow, particularly plants, or sometimes we call them autotrophs. What that means is that they might leave over compounds like nitrogen or carbon, even water or dirt, which is usually just animal poop. But what that means then is and that helps continue that recycling program by providing food and nutrients for our autotrophs. Ooh, wow, I already see a lot of questions too. Hold on just a second, we'll get to those, I promise. Now let's go ahead and just take a look at some of these tritivores, don't you think? Mind you, I said they're kind of small. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna try to share my screen here. We'll see if I have the option to. Um, and I'm gonna share a different camera, a kind of close-up cam. Let's see if you guys can see it. Ooh, I can see it on my screen. I'll move our light here so that way you guys get a better look. And while it might just look like a piece of dirt or maybe a log in between, this is where you're usually gonna find these detritivores or these types of decomposers. You might see some movement, but if I turn it over, what? <laughs> now you're seeing a lot more action. Now, a lot of these um, animals that you see under here, they're probably ones you're pretty familiar with. Almost everybody knows or has heard of roly polies before. Um, some people call them pill bugs or wood louse is another term that we use, mostly because they're the big eaters of decaying wood or wood fibers. And so you can see, there's tons of them on this one small piece too. You might notice if we move it around a little bit, there's a couple other little commotion happening in here. There's some more woodlouse species that we find. Sometimes you might even see things like slugs. I can see a little slug right over here. Also though, we'll find not only the detritivores or the things that can break down this dead organic plant matter, you also find their predators, um, carnivores. For example, we might be able to dig in the soil a little bit here. This is an excellent warm space for these guys. Oh, there he goes. Why? He's so fast. There is an animal in here, my friends, we call a centipede. And centipedes are not detritivores. Centipedes don't actually break down dead organic material. So then you have to imagine, well, why would they be hanging around this dead decaying log inside this um, area? It's because that's where their food is. See, centipedes are carnivores to a lot of these small detritivores, like millipedes or woodlaps, even spiders or crickets too. So not only are you gonna find detritivores in this kind of micro habitat, you're also gonna find their predators too. The really interesting thing though that I notice, especially if you ever look under a log or if you're trying to explore where these small detritivores are, is that there's a ton of them and there's a ton of types. Here's another thing to remember. Remember, these guys are eating and they're breaking down this organic matter. But if you look at it, do you think one roly-poly or one woodlouse is gonna be able to break down a whole log? Absolutely not. It would take years, eons for them to, just because they're so small and they aren't able to put all that much into their digestive system. So in order to make this process really efficient, you'll usually have hundreds to thousands of these individuals in one space, like inside a chunk of a log or a dead decaying tree or even under leaf litter too. That way this process doesn't take as long since you just have many individuals breaking down and eating this organic matter. Now, sometimes they can't eat all of it, but that's where those true decomposers come into play, those bacteria and fungi. They can take basically the remains, what's left over, that these detritivores can no longer eat or digest, and they're able to absorb and break down the rest, bring that back into the soil and provide those nutrients for those other autotrophs or those other plants too. 
but this this is what we most often see. Uh, if anybody has either a space where there is a fallen tree or a log, or if you still have some leaf litter, especially in your backyard, this is a great opportunity. It's a little cold today, so I'd wait until it gets a little warmer to try to go searching underneath that stuff if you really want to observe these detritivores up close. They're also really beneficial for gardening season. Um, a lot of people might do something called vermicompost, which is actually having earthworms be inside compost bins and more, mostly because they're also considered a type of detritivore. From there though, what it allows it is to bring those nutrients into that soil you want to use into your garden. Also great to have these kinds of detritivores too around. But these guys are just one small section. While yes, it's great to have millions and millions of things under its log, we know that fallen trees aren't really the only dead thing that we're gonna find out in nature, especially because plant material isn't the only stuff. We have to think of what about dead or decaying meat? What's gonna happen to those? Now, what we have are two other organisms that we're going to kind of focus on. This next one actually isn't even in Michigan, but I'm going to use a different term to describe it. We talked a lot about detritivores, and most of the time when you use this word, we think of things that eat almost solely dead, decaying plant material. So if we have to bring meat into the mix, usually you find slightly larger animals, mostly because the meat material tends to be larger, but we're going to focus and animals we call scavengers, which I bet a lot of people have heard of before. We have some great scavengers here in Michigan, but this first one, like I said, isn't actually from here. Scavengers are just basically big decomposers or big detritivores. They are able to eat the big stuff without having to have millions and millions of individuals to make that process efficient. The really interesting thing about this guy, and we'll make sure we talk about this too, is he also has some really great adaptations. Decomposers, because they're absorbing and taking in these nutrients from this dead decaying matter, they also hold a lot of those nutrients in their body, which make them, in simplest terms, really tasty snacks for other creatures. So this guy, if you're referencing food chains, he could be on the end of the spectrum because he can eat things once they decay, but he also can be really low on that spectrum as well. Let's go ahead and take a closer look. He's right here in my hand. Ta-da! Now, it may or may not be harder to see. I'll make sure I keep them a little closer to the camera. You actually can see the size of my hand for a reference. And some people may know this kind of animal. Even if he's not from around Michigan, he's a kind of cockroach. And yes, we do have cockroaches in Michigan. They're a whole lot faster, a lot smaller, but they too are considered a type of detritivore or scavenger. They eat both plant and meat matter, at least when it's dead or decaying. And that's why cockroaches play such a great role here. Remember, they're acting like a cleanup crew. They're basically taking and eating things that most animals don't want to eat. It's also good to put it into perspective that without animals like this guy, we would basically be standing in dead stuff, dead plant, dead decaying, rotting meat. So these guys, in a way, help to make sure that the nature around us stays clean, at least according to our perspective. Now, this kind of cockroach is called a Madagascar hissing cockroach, again, living in a very tropical part of the world, which is one of the reasons why he's allowed to get to be so much bigger. He doesn't have to worry about finding a way to survive wintery seasons. It's 70 degrees and sunny all the time where he lives. So instead, they focus on finding that kind of food they need. And you can imagine living in a tropical space that there's a lot of great plant and animal material that's decaying that you can take on. And it's true, even though these guys are small, that means they do end up forming colonies or we find them with multiple individuals in order to be able to take care of that dead decaying material. But there's more. Remember I talked about these adaptations, these things that help these animals survive? And insects primarily are great sources of protein for other animals. You can see he's in lamest terms, just a pretty chunky insect. Well, what that means is that that has to find a way to protect itself so that he can continue to survive as well. These Madagascar hissing cockroaches, they can live to be up to five years old sometimes, which means that's a lot of years for them to be able to break down this dead organic material. But here's what he does. That word Madagascar hissing cockroach, that's key. Because while it might be hard to see with the camera, this guy has great camouflage to be able to hide under leaf litter or 
inside logs, but he actually has these little black dots around his abdomen. And those dots are actually holes. See, what this guy does, you can see he's not the fastest insect in the world. He doesn't actually have any wings, which is good because if you're going underneath logs or leaf litters, that could actually scratch your ring, wings really well. So what happens though, is he blows air using muscles that he contracts in his abdomen, and he blows air through those holes. And he makes that really loud shh or hiss noise, almost like a, a snake or a cat. And the great thing is, is if an animal can't see him, say he's hiding under leaf litter and more, what that means is that he might be tricked into thinking he's this really ginormous animal, when in fact he's just a cockroach. But does that work every time? No, not really. There are definitely times where these guys are exposed and they become delicious snacks. But that's the kind of other side too of these recyclers. Many small ones bring nutrients into the soil for plants to grow and then contain nutrients and conserve energy in themselves to be snacks for other animals looking for live food. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second before I keep going and I wanna make sure I'm gonna check in with our other hosts to see if we had any questions so far. I know some folks open or raise their hands, but I just wanna double check. Galen or Missy, do you guys see any questions? Hmm. If not, it's totally okay. Don't hear from anybody yet. So I'm gonna assume we don't have questions yet. So then I'm gonna keep going. Now, other scavengers that we tend to find here in Michigan are usually small mammals. Um, we humans can probably relate to finding certain creatures that roam around our trash, like raccoons or possums, skunks, rats, rodents, even more. And one interesting thing to note is that some of these creatures that we talk about, we can classify them as scavengers, but that doesn't have to be their sole diet. For this cockroach, that's really all he eats. He doesn't usually eat live stuff or live plants. Part of that is because of just how small his mouth is. You might be able to see the two antenna that are sticking out from the top of his head, um, but when you look at this cockroach, you can't actually see his head. It's hidden underneath this helmet. But what he has are these two small jaws, we call them mandibles, and they don't really function that well, or they can't eat really hard, sturdy, chunky food. If you think about how, say, our three states of matter work, um, solids, liquids, and gases. If you focus on solids, their molecules are so tightly packed together that solids are very sturdy objects. This guy can't really break down this sturdy material. However, usually when the world of decomposition happens, a lot of this stuff, when it starts to break down, it becomes soft, mushy, warm, usually has an interesting smell, and it makes it a lot easier for this insect to take its jaws and break down that material. Some of the scavengers that we see here, like the mammals that sometimes go through our trash, they can still take on things like fish, alive insects, amphibians, and more, mostly because of how they're able to eat that food. So interesting thought when it comes to some of these insects that are considered Considered to try divorce or scavengers. Part of the reason they're able to eat that food resource is just because of how their jaw and their digestive system works. And like earthworms or like some of these other detritivores, his excrement, feces, or if you want to be really silly, you can just call it poop, is great soil. That's also where he can deposit some of these nutrients that these plants need to grow. That's why we focus so much on different animal species when it comes to, say, gardening. Even things like bat poop, we call it guano at least, it's great for gardening because of how much nitrogen in it that those plants need to be able to grow. But we in Michigan were really lucky. We have some ginormous scavengers, and here's why. We also have a lot of ginormous matter or ginormous organic matter that somehow needs to get broken down. And when you think of animals like hyenas that are from around the world or animals that need to be large in order to be able to scavenge, it's usually because they're the ones that take care of the large rotting meat. Now, some of you might have noticed there's this box behind me. We're actually going to look at the thing that's inside this box. This is probably Michigan's largest scavenger. Remember, just to recap, scavengers, we're usually talking about big decaying meat eaters versus detritivores. We usually just focus on plants and they tend to be smaller. 
then you have your true decomposers like bacteria and fungi. Don't want that idea to get lost. Now when we meet this animal, she's most comfortable sitting on a perch here on the table. I'll make sure that my camera here is down a little bit so you guys can see her. And many of you humans are probably seeing this animal right now because it migrates. I mean, think about it. If you're a scavenger eating large decaying meat items, it's gonna be really hard to find it here in our winter seasons, mostly because it's either gonna be covered in snow or it's just gonna freeze and not be edible anymore. So these guys actually migrate down south as south um, as Florida in some years in order to be able to find fresh decaying meat, if you will. But now they're coming back up, not only for their breeding season, but because it's getting warmer here. What I'll make sure I do is I set up her perch so you all can take a closer look. And we'll talk about the same idea with a cockroach, these adaptations or physical features that we see. A lot of what you notice on this animal is key to her being a scavenger, being able to take on these large amounts of decaying food. And the really cool thing is if you've recognized this animal before, we'll get her perch ready here, that you may already know some of these adaptations or these thoughts that we have about how this animal is to survive and find the food. Now, the weird thing about big scavengers like this animal isn't necessarily that they bring nutrients back into the soil. What they're really doing is conserving that energy for later in their bodies when they eventually pass too. All right, we'll bring this camera down a little bit. I'm going to have her come out here on my glove. You may already have an idea of what kind of animal it is, especially just by looking at my glove. Step up. If you've ever been to the Leslie Science and Nature Center, you might have an idea of what kind of animal she is if you've ever seen us present before. Or if you've ever had the chance to visit. Good girl. <laughs> a little larger than our cockroach and a little larger than some other detritivores or scavengers we talk about. You can use my head or face as a reference. We'll have her out here on my glove for just a few seconds so she gets used to these surroundings and then we'll stick her on my perch. Ooh, I actually see a question here so I'm gonna pause. I had somebody ask what animals eat cockroaches and how big is a Michigan cockroach? Well, we actually have a lot of animals, especially mammals here, off that eat cockroaches. Um, you can think of both raccoons and possums. Remember, yes, they're scavengers, but they can take on live food. We have a lot of birds, um, say insectivores, even robins can sometimes take on cockroaches. Small rodents, things like um, mice, rats, even squirrels sometimes will take on a cockroach. But the biggest cockroach that I've ever seen here in Michigan was actually no bigger than my thumbnail. Um, not to say that they can't get any bigger, but at least that's the biggest one I've seen. Also, most cockroaches that we have that live here also have wings, which way they're able to get away or escape really fast. But remember, they're great detritivores, so they're important to have even if we don't always want them in our human spaces. Now, let's get to this scavenger. She's sitting very well for you all to see. This guy is a turkey vulture, and turkey vultures are the only native species of vulture we have here in Michigan but they're under the bird category of raptors or birds of prey. Because even though they're eating dead material, they still have some of these hunter-esque adaptations, even though they're hunting dead stuff. Just when it compared to something like an eagle or a hawk or a falcon, how they use these adaptations is a bit different. For example, we usually classify raptors by having this really sharp, long curved beak. You can see the white beak on her face and these four sharp curved talons to be able to grab onto their food. Well, if your food's not alive anymore, you don't really need to worry about grabbing it before it escapes. So the really big adaptation for vultures is their sense of smell. Many raptors don't actually have a sense of smell. They don't need to. They can rely on other keen adaptations. But vultures, because their food is relatively, <clears throat> excuse me, potent, they actually use their smell primarily to search or scavenge for their food. Sometimes you can even look through their nostrils so the air can get in through those pathways really easily. Here's the really cool part. Scientists are actually trying to study turkey vulture brains to really see of all the vultures in the world who has the best sense of smell. And well, you can't just find, you know, vulture brains wherever you go. From what they've studied so far, they have learned that turkey vultures, the part of their brain that is associated with their sense of smell, is twice as large as any other vulture brain. Meaning, if you make that correlation, that they have the best sense of smell of all vultures we know of. 
stuff. Especially if you ever know the um, local celebrity, Joe Riley, he even has a rap about turkey vultures. I encourage you all to listen for it. But they talk about how turkey vultures can smell up to a mile away. Here's the other cool thing. Um, we actually can find turkey vultures in a lot of different habitats versus there are some other vultures that can really only scavenge in certain spaces. Um, we find them not only in open farmlands or plains, prairies, we can also find turkey vultures staying in forests. Why? Well, while they do have pretty good eyesight, since their smell works so well, better than some other vultures we know of, like black vultures down in Ohio, they're able to primarily just use their smell to sniff out their food. They don't need to rely just on their eyesight like some other vultures might need to. So they can occupy more or a wider variety of habitats to be able to go searching for their food. I did have another great question. I love this question. Somebody asked, why are turkey vultures heads bald? Remember how I mentioned that these adaptations we see to help them be able to be great scavengers? Well, you can imagine if you are an eater of dead stuff, dead rotting meat primarily, that when you stick your face head first into your food, you're gonna get some of that decaying rotting material on your face. So these guys, because they can't reach their feathers on their face, they can't pick at them. What that means is that their face is bald, so that way it helps kind of keep their face clean. That's one space they don't have to worry about to make sure they pick at to be able to clean off any of that rotting material. They don't want to carry it with them. They're excellent cleaners to make sure they clean off the rest of their feathers though. Ooh, I have another good question. We had somebody ask not only how far can this turkey vulture smell, but also do turkey vultures smell us? One, we said that some turkey vultures can smell up to a mile away. It's amazing how far they can smell, way better than my nose. And can turkey vultures smell us? Absolutely. I'm sure we humans have a very unique scent and they can smell other live animals too. Whether or not we know what they think of our smell, that's one thing. But they know that we aren't any kind of prey to them and that they won't go scavenging for us. However, it does make me wonder what they think we smell like now come to think of it. The other cool thing though, it might be a little hard to see, um, or actually her feet, oh, I can move back a little bit so you can see her feet a little better. She may go back in her box or preen and clean herself. This is a really cool behavior to see, by the way. I mean, she's really comfortable with all of you on this camera screen. Um, but her feet are actually structured in a unique way to compare to other raptors. These guys have humongous feet, especially their middle toe. It's incredibly long. And that is because a lot of the things that they eat are going to be on flat surfaces. They're going to be on the ground. So this animal needs to worry more about balancing on a flatter surface like the ground to actually eat their food rather than perching on really thin spaces, thin tree branches and more. Yes, they can roost and nest up in the tree still for sure. But when they're eating, they want to be able to stay balanced. So they have this really long middle toe to be able to sit there, rest their weight on their feet, and be able to eat things off of the ground too. Their feet, just like their head, are also bald. Why? Well, these guys have this black feather plumage, which is great when we usually find turkey vultures. We see them soaring with these giant five and a half foot wingspans, and they're kind of teeter-tottering in the air. That's because they're riding these really hot thermals, we call, or air currents we call thermals. And what's happening, though, is that with this bald feet, it actually helps to keep them cool. When your feathers are black, looks like she's done for us for the day. When your feathers are black like this, you absorb a ton of heat. So in order to keep yourself cool while you're searching for your food, she does something that um, kangaroos actually do too. She goes to the bathroom on her legs. Now, I know that seems silly, but that actually just helps with the process of evaporation, meaning that she can cool her legs off just by going to the bathroom on them. And that way it evaporates off her legs and keeps her cooler while she's eating. Pretty amazing. Interesting adaptations, but also very useful. I see we did have another question. We had somebody ask, you know so much about bugs. And we'd be able to answer a question about love bugs. Ooh, we had somebody from Florida. Welcome. Thanks for seeing us in Michigan. And we say that there's a bunch of love bugs around. What animals feed on love bugs? That's a great question. And I'll be honest, I don't know a ton about love bugs. But I can at least speculate that most insect hunters that we have here in Michigan may be similar to ones that we have in Florida. Now, one of the things that could happen is you think of a lot of small rodents that are insect hunters here. You can also think of, excuse me, even other birds, larger birds of prey. 
Also though, in Florida, you guys have a lot of great reptiles and amphibians that are also great insect eaters. I don't know if there's ones that would be able to occupy human spaces, like around our neighborhoods that could eat those, but I bet you that there's a bunch of different kinds of small reptiles that would be great, great predators to something like a love bug. For folks that are unsure what that is, because this we're a little short on time, I'm gonna encourage you guys to see if you can discover what those guys look like. Cool question though. I did have another one I wanna make sure I answered. Somebody asked how old is this vulture because she looks old. <laughs> she is definitely an adult um, and she's big too. Uh, most of the time in the bird kingdom, the females are actually larger than the males. So she's a very hefty size, mostly because they have to you know, hold calcium inside, uh, inside their body to be able to lay their eggs and if they have to protect their nest. This turkey vulture, I would say she's at least 11 or 12. But in, say, our raptor kingdom, uh, in the wild, 14 or 15 years old is a really good uh, lifespan for these creatures. However, in captivity, many of these raptors can live to be into their late 20s, even early 30s. So while she's been teaching for a relatively long time, she actually is known to have a larger or longer lifespan here in captivity. Here's the other thing I will note too. Um, none of these animals that you have met today are my pets. Uh, if anybody has ever seen a presentation from the Leslie Science Nature Center or seen these animals at the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, note that many of them are with us because of an injury to where they can not be released into the wild. One of the reasons we let this animal rest on this perch is actually because she has a broken wrist, a broken wrist and shoulder that's never fully healed. So she can't actually extend her wings out all the way as she would need to be able to to soar. Because she's unable to fly like she would need to out in the wild, that is why she's with us. However, she still is very much a wild animal and we make sure we respect her space and time, letting her go in and out of that box whenever she needs to. Great questions to too, by the way. I'll make sure that I keep our Q&A open. I know I only have a couple more minutes left. Um, what as other things that I want to make sure is mentioned though is that not only do we meet these different detritivores or decomposers, but the next part of this kind of comes a challenge. As we're celebrating Earth Day and you know we're finding different ways to stay safe and stay healthy all while being at home, there's actually a lot of great ways to discover this stuff, especially when you're looking at tiny objects like these tiny detritivores. I already mentioned that there might be some things right outside your window or right outside in your backyard that you can actually discover when it comes to these detritivores. It's it's also important to know why they're important and how we can better respect them by leaving things like certain decaying logs, dead decaying material, fallen leaves, and more in or around our property that allows great food, shelter, and more, not only for these detritivores, but also for animals that eat them, like say salamanders, small reptiles, or better yet, if you have decaying meat, a great snack for something as big as a turkey vulture too. And so you are always welcome if you have any questions or concerns about things you see, or if you guys ever want to learn more about nature's recyclers, especially the ones that we find here in Michigan, then you guys are always welcome to reach out to us at the Leslie Science and Nature Center in the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. I believe we're just about out of time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the attention back over to Galen and Missy, who are our other co-hosts, and thanks everybody for attending our presentation today. Happy Earth Day!